Welcome everybody to this guest lecture in the AP Daily Series. My name is Samir Dayal. I'm a professor of English and Media Studies at Bentley University in Waltham, Massachusetts. I'm very pleased to have been asked to speak with you today. My general topic is the literature of migration. And my particular focus, as my title indicates, is transcultural reading. Why this topic? We live in a time when even under conditions of a global pandemic or a planetary crisis, the world is increasingly globalized. There is an ever increasing and ever intensifying flow of goods, services, capital, information, images, and most importantly for my purposes, people, including labor, tourists, asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants. I want to read closely with you just one short story about the migrant experience to suggest its rich significance for the larger body of migrant literature or literature of migration as world literature. So let me begin with the definition of two interrelated terms or categories of terms. Take intercultural first. When people or even texts from different cultures come into contact or collide, their contact is intercultural. In an intercultural contact zone, the cultures, people, and texts from different cultures can be transformed in fundamental ways. And the process can be called transculturalism or transculturation. In the context of global flows, such intercultural contact zones uh, and border crossings are increasingly significant. And one of the richest explorations or expressions of the experience of this transculturation, its promises as well as its challenges, can be found in the fiction of migration. And this is what I hope will emerge from our look at a single short story today. Given the short time I have, I want to look at just one short story from a collection by Nina Swami Dasmit McConaughey entitled Cowboys and East Indians, winner of the 2014 Penn Open Book Award and one of Oprah's 2014's best prize winning books. Born in Singapore, Nina McConaughey emigrated to the United States, to Wyoming with her parents. And she still lives there and teaches at the University of Wyoming. Her short stories are set in small town Wyoming, but they gesture towards an iconic larger landscape, partly real and partly mythic, the American West of cowboys and Indians from which she derives her title. The title of her book and the title story allude to this foundational mythic narrative, but also destabilize it, casting it in a new and ironic light, as I will show today. The collection opens with not so much a full, fully developed uh, short story, but a one page sketch called Melting. This sketch introduces a major theme or frame for the work, book as a whole, the transcultural challenge of defining cultural and personal identities in intercultural contact zones. In the sketch, two East Indian cousins are misrecognized by their mainstream white American peers as the wrong kind of Indians. These Indians are not the Indians of Western law, but even if they had been Arapaho, Shoshone, and Crow, they would have been wrong. For they are just foils, even in the original myth, to make the white normative cowboys right as the ideal or norm of American masculinity. So the collection as a whole signals the wrongness of East Indians by invoking and then subverting the myth of the American West. The two cousins in this sketch and, in, and other East Indians in the collection as a whole are not seen for what they really are but they are misrecognized in their difference from the mainstream. 
Thus, they're both visible and invisible. Besides, they stick out. They, they also attract unwelcome and even hostile attention from those around them. In that sense, they are also hypervisible. So at the same time, they can be visible, invisible, and hypervisible. In the mythic narrative of cowboys and Indians, the cowboy was always the norm or ideal against which the Indian was structurally positioned as inferior and incomplete or defective in some way. This logic is analogous to the logic of colonialism, imperialism, sexism, and racism. These themes are pertinent for our time when such conflicts are at the forefront of our contemporary social and political lives. As the title story opens, we see the narrator who is not yet named driving along a highway and she sees a group of young women walking on the side of the road. She thinks they are Indian and for that reason pulls over to offer them a ride because she thinks they are Indians. This reason is deeply entangled already with the issue of racialized recognition or misrecognition. How does she know? Is it stereotyping that she's engaging in or is it identification? That is to say, does she see them as racially marked as different or does she somehow see them as identical with herself in some way or the same as herself? So this question of um, recognition and misrecognition is being highlighted here. She pulls over, she offers them a ride. As they get into her minivan, they begin to ask her a similar question. They say, are you Indian? And the narrator didn't answer the question. The question is repeated, are you Indian? And she just pulls the door open without answering. The girl tries again a third time. From India, she says. I looked into their, their expectant faces and finally she says, yes. The question is, why does she delay? Why does she hesitate? Uh, what is she holding back, if anything? She does give her name to them. She says, my name's Faith. But this doesn't help in a way. The name Faith confuses them, this group of women, who turn out to be, by the way, uh, Indian graduate students. So this space is an in-between space, confusing, undecidable, where the drama of recognition and misrecognition will play out. Faith does tell us more about herself. But what she provides is not straightforward autobiography, but rather an account that undercuts itself, calls itself into question, adding more confusion. First, Faith presents what she calls an encyclopedia of facts. She tells us that she had for two years lived in India before being adopted by Ellen and Mike Henderson of Torrington, Wyoming. Before I went to live with Mike uh, and Ellen, who worked at the sugar factory, she says, I knew I was born in Madras with a population of 6.9 million, abandoned on the doorsteps of St. Joseph's, which is a church, uh, with a population of 230. She tells us that she was colicky, and that colic affects 22.5% of newborns. She herself was not newborn. She also tells us that she was Hindu with a caste mark on her head when she was left at the doorstep of the church. So she presents us with this encyclopedia of facts, presumably incontestable, uh, reliable, objective. But then she transitions. She says, and then there was the fiction of memory. Now we know that memory, even the scientists tell, tell us this, memory is always a reconstruction. It is always selective, not mimetic. It is always subjective and therefore at some level unreliable. So faith casts her memories into uncertainty by designating them first as fiction of memory and then going further and distancing herself from her own memories. Clearly, some of what she remembers is patently implanted, simulated memory, borrowed memory, borrowed from her mother's. She says, my memories were not mine. But she even uh, questions her own uh, memory. She points out that sometimes in my head, I hear Hindi, I would say. Years later, I realized Hindi was not spoken in Madras. I must have her Tamil. So she's basically questioning her own account of herself. This only serves to confuse the question of recognition, misrecognition, and identity construction. So this is a strange medley of construction of identity. It is essentially transcultural, and it highlights the fact that her identity will be and is 
mobile. Fate's medley of facts and fiction of memory is augmented by descriptions of a few photographs that she does have. But these, we also know that photographs, like memories, are constructed, they are selective, they are framings of reality and not mere uh, slavish reproductions of it. So they are also, despite their appearance, um, not entirely reliable. Besides, the, the photographs that do exist of her are sort of disturbing. She points out here that in this one photograph that she's describing, my shaved head gave me a grim look. She is like a shorn sheep. I look like a little black sheep who had met with an accident. So this is a disturbing photograph of herself as almost animal-esque, a shorn sheep with hooves. Mike holds, Mike is her father who is a veterinarian, and he holds one of her feet like a hoof. And this literal reference is almost creepy. Uh, it suggests that he, would, he treats her as an animal. Look also at the idiom of the black sheep. Uh, literally, she looks like a black sheep because of her dark hair. But there is also the metaphor of black sheep. A black sheep is some, somebody like a pariah, uh, an outcast, somebody who doesn't follow the rules, somebody who is the black sheep of the family is kind of a person who doesn't go along with the, the family's traditions or the society's uh, protocols. Later, this animal imagery will become a motif of her dehumanization, repeated in many ways. The motif of animals in any case is not incidental or accidental. And by the story's conclusion, it will become it will morph into a key figure for her transculturated identity. Her only other photograph is no less disturbing. It's a photograph of herself on the day of adoption being handed over to her parents by her white clad uh, orphanage staff. She says, I am like a spot of blood among the whiteness of their clothes. This is a violent image and sinister, also dehumanizing the human child is reduced to a formless piece of bit of organic matter, a spot of blood, uh, not a complete human being. It carries on the image of um, violence, the black sheep who had met with an accident, here becomes a spot of blood. So there is something very odd about her way of constructing her identity. Fate's failure to belong is also experienced in the intimate social sphere as a complicated negotiation of identity positions. Here, Faith imagines being included in a potentially intercultural community, even a family. And this is the family of the graduate students, the Indian graduate students that she had picked up. She imagines them sitting around the table, laughing at white people. This last bit was a surprise to me, she says. I had pretty much only known white people. But then she says, I felt ready not to be in the minority. And I realized that for the first time in my life, I was not. So she imagines being included in this community of foreign students, family away from family, but Faith's own imagined positioning within this hypothetical intercultural family is a transcultural conundrum. She imagines laughing at white people with the East Indians. Tellingly, this is a surprise to her because as she says, Formerly, she had pretty much known only white people. Maybe she had even thought of herself as being part of the white world, a world in which her color, her ethnicity, and her race were not marked, were not at the forefront of her, converse, uh, of her consciousness. But now she feels ready not to be in the minority. And she realized that for the first time in my life, I was not. But sadly, this potentially intercultural contact zone this family is a space as a space for faith's reintegration into authentic Indianness is only the fantasy of a rootless immigrant in Wyoming. In another scene, one of the graduate students, Suparna, makes an overture, uh, an intercultural overture to her. She cries on her shoulder, on, on the narrator's shoulder, and says, I miss home. And Faith seems to think of this as a, an opportunity for bonding over the, the figure of the home. So she says, 
I do too. My eyes filled with tears. But where is home exactly? For Suparna, clearly, there is a home waiting for her back in India. It's, it is fixed. It is stable. It is something that she can point to. For Faith, there has never been a stable home. A home for her is always and will remain a moving target, mobile, just as her identity remains mobile. We have seen how Faith repeatedly attempts to be reintegrated into, into the fold of authentic Indianness rather than being always the wrong kind of Indian. But she's always thwarted. She wishes to be part of the graduate student family. She says, I knew they were having family meals. Was I not part of the family? I was Indian once. And the reader must ask, was she ever really Indian? Was she ever authentically Indian? This question of authenticity then comes to the fore. Here she's invited to a Hindu festival celebration called Diwali. And she cannot even pronounce the word. She's corrected and laughed at. She tries on Indian clothes at this event and they don't really fit her or she cannot carry them off properly. She even tries to cook an Indian dish and take it to the celebrations, a dish of uh, tandoori chicken, but nobody eats it. She has to eat it herself along with a few other white guests too. So all of these attempts fail. She's marked again as the wrong kind of Indian, even for the Indians themselves. One of the graduate students says to her, it's weird, you don't look Indian to me. And she replies, yeah, well, I'm from here, as if to excuse her misfit. She's, she recognizes this as a lame reply. So she's saddened that she's excluded from this family that she hoped to belong to. And this sadness is compounded by the fact that as she realizes, the only thing that she has of value to, to these Indians is simply that she owns a car, a mode of transportation. So far, we've seen that intercultural misrecognition comes primarily from other East Indians, other Indians, uh, at least in the story. And now she turns and points out that it also comes from her presumably white boyfriend, who thinking that he's saying something good or nice to her, she just says, you know, I don't see you as brown. And she sees that this is no real compliment. And then she goes on to say, later, he backpedaled. The night after Cal told me he didn't see me as brown, he backpedaled. The next day, he told me I was exotic. And that was what he liked. I didn't know which, what was worse, exotic. Now, Cal probably says this because he thinks it's a better kind of compliment. Um, it, it, there's a kind of erotic charge to this notion uh, ordinarily. He hyper-visibilizes her as a kind of beautiful, erotic person, exotic. But she, interestingly, does not see it as sexualization, but rather as animalization by associating it with what Mike thinks of when he thinks of the exotic. She tells us that every year in Mike's practice, exotic pets would come in, pets who'd not adapted. Sometimes I would help hold them while he inspected them, looked for the hurt. People, he said, should not keep exotic pets in this place. So this is very rich language. And when she's describing Mike's exotic animals, she is consciously or unconsciously also speaking of herself. In her mind, the exotic is animalized and dehumanized. The exotic indicates someone who is not adapted, like the unassimilated Indian immigrant she is. Like the exotic pet, Faith too is adopted, but not adapted. The exotic is like the exotic pet, potentially hurt or damaged in some way. Mike always looked for the hurt. So this is a very interesting uh, way of referring to her own, her own identity through the eyes of others. An understated but radical shift in consciousness is introduced at this uh, moment of the of the story. In this passage, she, she describes being on holiday and she visits a farm where she's watching horses. Her attention, her eye is drawn to this llama in the barn. The llama is aloof, he's separated from the pack of animals and the llama is watching the other animals but is not seeking to be part of them. She describes the, the llama as a loner. She says, I saw this llama in the barn. The climate doesn't bother them. They are loners and need little care. She walks over to the creature and begins to change the water for the llama. But the next thing I knew, I was covered in warm vomit. Mike later told me it was spit. 
Interestingly, instead of being angry, she says, I respected it. How do we understand this? The, the Lama is a loner figure, and in that sense, recalls the cowboy whose main characteristic is that he is also a loner. The cowboy also, like the Lama, resists domestication. Uh, in, that, in the case of the cowboy, he always rejects marriage. He does not uh, accept committed love with a woman. He always, he needs little care like the Lama. He always leaves the settled home for the wide open spaces of the Western, uh, the American West. The cowboy then is defined essentially by his loner qualities, by his mobility. If earlier Faith had felt excluded on many fronts, she had felt excluded from India, she doesn't really belong there, she cannot go back there, home is not India. So she's felt excluded both from India and from belonging in the United States. She's incompletely adapted even in the United States. So she has no home. She feels excluded in that sense. She's also felt animalized as we've seen, including by her own father, the vet who holds her foot like a hoof. She'd felt dehumanized. She didn't have her own kind. She's denied full humanity on many levels. She'd also felt exoticized even, even by her own boyfriend. All of this produces a certain kind of anxiety about belonging, about identity, a kind of alienation in a bad sense. But the encounter with the Lama now will produce something radically transformative, a transculturation. In the last paragraph of the short story, she says, people stick to their own kind. And then she asks the rhetorical question. And when they don't have kind, and she answers it, then they are exotic. I turned around, she says, and walked back toward the community center. The girls would need a ride home. I stopped outside, the light shone out of the windows. I gazed in at them and watched. This is the same language that is used about the Lama, watching from a distance from the outside. This fascinating rhetorical question, and when they don't have kind, reframes the key theme of dehumanization that I've been touching upon. When they don't have kind suggests that they do not belong to any group. They don't have any kind to belong to. So this, this dehumanization is now redefined here uh, as something possibly positive. She says, then they are exotic. So if formerly she had found the term exotic to be not a positive uh, category, now there's something else going on. At the story's final movement, we are told that Faith turned around and walked back toward the community center. I'll say more about the, the term exotic in a second. But just notice the language that carries the passage forward. So she, her turning around is at some level uh, literal, physical. She turns, literally turns and walk backs to, uh, walks back towards the community center, towards the girls who are waiting to, who will be wanting a ride home. But figuratively too, she has turned around from obsessive, anxious, self-concern, self-regard to a kind of altruism. The girls would need a ride home. So, so now she's thinking about offering the girls a ride home. Formerly, she had felt sad that the only thing that was of value in her was the fact that she had a car. Now she is reconciled to that, to that position of being of service to somebody else, altruistically. Now she's reconciled to that idea, but also to the fact that even though she does not have a home that she can go back to really, uh, she will be willing to give them a ride home, a home to which she is not welcome. So Faith's earlier isolation, and here I'm turning back to this notion of the exotic for a second, Faith's earlier isolation has become a transvalued alienation, an alienation that is like the Lama's aloofness and loner quality, those qualities that make him exotic. He doesn't have other kind. He doesn't seek belonging to them. Even more powerfully than the loner quality of the cowboy. She's identifying here with the Lama's loner characteristics. The Lama is on the outside, gazing in at the other animals. He's seen as being, uh, he, as, as watching from a distance. And she identifies with this alienation, this outsider quality. Uh, in the passage itself, she says, I gazed in at them and watched. So for her, the exotic too has been transculturated. Now the exotic connotes not only eroticization or sexualization or animalization or dehumanization or 
just failure to adapt or even just isolation, but now it is strength, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and a positive alienation. So we have seen that faith undergoes a radical transculturation across several boundaries and borders. First, this transculturation is cross species. The human being, in this case faith, identifies with an animal, the llama. Through faith's identification with the llama, animality itself has become come to mean something new and positive, not just a demeaning dehumanization. Second, her transculturation is across the racial ethnic border. Now it is the East Indian who redefines the mythology of the cowboys and Indians. So that this gives meaning to the title of the short story and the collection, Cowboys and East Indians have displaced the image of cowboys and Indians. So one could say that the, the myth has been transvalued again to cowboys and East Indians. Finally, her transculturation also crosses the gender divide, redefining the male myth of the cowboy and Indian male, so that it is not the cowboy who rides off into the sunset on a horse into the American West, but the East Indian woman in her minivan. So I hope I've shown that a transcultural reading, a reading attentive to and sensitive to the dynamics of transculturalism can help us to see transculturation's promise as well as challenge, but also to appreciate how migrant fictions the literature of migration might cast a humanizing and universalizing light on the struggle to find belonging, to define a complicated, possibly unrooted identity in multicultural and globalized contexts. I'm grateful then to have had this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.